background to his current job. Um, and uh, we were talking about different forms of Australian football, which I still have a hard time keeping straight. So I know he's a Richmond Tigers fan. He's going to tell us which sport that is um, in, in a moment. But, uh, but in any event, uh, let me uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Joe Hockey to the, to the podium. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Matt. When I, when I talk about sport, I uh, have many codes. With a name like hockey, I'm very popular in Canada. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in fact, Stephen Harper keeps sending me uh, hockey jerseys, hockey books, warm wishes, Stephen, and so on. And, uh, uh, and, uh, but yes, I'm a great fan of AFL, Richmond Tigers. And in fact, in rugby league, my team just won the premiership, South Sydney Rabbitohs. So uh, I feel as though, even though all my teams don't always win, at least I have one winner this year. And the second winner I hopefully have is the G20, uh, which has been uh, incredibly demanding, but incredibly rewarding this year. And uh, I want to thank you for the invitation to speak and uh, also the CSIS, which has these wonderful new premises. Uh, I suspect far more impressive than our embassy across the road. So we'll have to do something about that. I'm sure the, you are, uh, you are. the you ambassador are. <laughs> uh, is very keen to... In fact, the ambassador was just asking me for some renovation money, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> his timing is perfect. And to my parliamentary colleague, Steve Chobo, who is here, and uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Dr Martin Parkinson, uh, thank you so much. And, uh, of course, this address comes to you in the lead-up to the fourth and final G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting under Australia's presidency. Uh, we'll meet again in Brisbane uh, in support of the leaders, uh, but uh, this is uh, the, effectively the final operational meeting of the year. So when we came to government in September last year, uh, we thought carefully about how to run the G20. We knew we needed to address both the nature of the meetings and, of course, their substance. On the former, we wanted to lift the focus of leaders, ministers and governors to the things that only they could drive and influence. To do that, we wanted to create opportunities for them to have frank discussions on the practical delivery of reforms. After all, no decisions are implementable unless we are able to take our communities and our parliaments with us on the journey. In relation to policy substance, we recognised that the G20 is at a crossroad. That's why we laid down four vital but achievable criteria. First, the G20 needs concrete, practical outcomes that withstand the annual change in the presidency. Second, those outcomes have to be well communicated by political leaders. Third, the outcomes have to be an integral part of a broader, enduring economic narrative. And fourth, we thought it was important to raise the cost of failure, to make clear to G20 members that the world was watching and judging us on the implementation of our decisions. Today, I'd like to give you an overview of what the G20 agenda has achieved to date against these four criteria. I'll also outline the path to the Brisbane Leaders' Summit. When I was sworn in as Australian Treasurer in September last year, it was obvious that the challenge ahead would be to maintain the G20's sense of purpose and direction. To reinvigorate the group, the agenda had to focus on achieving outcomes and uniting around an ambitious but deliverable target. We determined that Australia's G20 year would focus on improving economic growth. This was particularly important given the frequency of downward revisions in growth forecasts by the IMF in the wake of the global financial crisis. Before our first meeting in Sydney, we promised to be good stewards of the institution by maintaining the G20's relevance and keeping a steadfast global focus, no matter what the challenges of the time. With that promise in mind, we identified how our success as G20 president would be defined. We could claim success if we achieved a number of practical outcomes. Firstly, 
We needed to deliver policies that lift growth and create jobs. Secondly, we wanted a more robust and trustworthy financial system that supports the growth objective. And finally, we wanted to deliver on the commitments made at St Petersburg to a fair and effective international tax framework that rebuilds community trust in the global taxation system. There are several layers to this plan, so let me expand on each initiative. First, we are on track to deliver practical actions to lift growth and create jobs. In February, finance ministers and governors agreed to the Sydney Declaration, which sets out to lift our collective global GDP by more than 2% over the next five years through new structural reforms driven by individual governments. This was a first for the G20. There had always been words to reflect ambition, but never numbers, let alone a target. In fact, we described it as an ambitious target. By Cairns, just a few weeks ago, G20 member countries had put forward over 900 measures. The IMF and the OECD estimated that our efforts could lift global GDP by 1.8% over five years, relative to the pre-existing growth profile. It could deliver an additional $2 trillion to the world economy, and of course, millions of new jobs. So we're 90% of the way there. That's why we will intensify our efforts to find the final 10% before the Brisbane Leaders Summit in November. In Brisbane, members will present their new policy actions to lift growth. With these actions, we will lay down a credible policy monitoring process involving the IMF and the OECD. This will constitute the Brisbane Action Plan. <coughs> In developing the growth strategies, members have in particular focused on lifting investment in infrastructure, which I understand you've been talking about a bit today. Because through investment in infrastructure, we can address demand weakness and improve productivity. In Sydney, we thought carefully about initiatives that lift infrastructure investment, with an emphasis on fostering more private sector involvement. Some months later in Cairns, we agreed to a global infrastructure initiative, which is about increasing quality infrastructure, not just amongst G20 member nations, but right across the world. The initiative includes members' individual commitments to improve domestic investment climates, as well as collective actions to facilitate the development of infrastructure as an asset class, as well as improving project planning and preparation and reducing information asymmetries. We're committed to developing a database, a global database of infrastructure projects to help match potential investors with projects. We also want to create a knowledge platform that helps to build public sector expertise and develop standardised documentation that reduces the costs of new investment and risks of new investment, I should add. We agreed to a set of best practices to help countries promote and prioritise quality investment and foster flows of long-term institutional investment. And we will support work to help grow new sources of finance for government and for investment. In Brisbane next month, we hope to announce a mechanism that will help us deliver this important multi-year initiative to be known as the Global Infrastructure Centre. This centre can bring together in a single hub governments, international organisations and the private sector to facilitate a knowledge and information platform for new infrastructure or upgraded infrastructure across developed, developing and developing, developed economies. The centre already has the strong support of international business community, including the B20. In fact, the B20 estimates that establishing a global infrastructure hub could help facilitate tens of billions of dollars of annual infrastructure investment. It's clear that with the cost of capital at record lows, the time is right for action on infrastructure investment. Second, we are on track to completing key elements of the policy response 
to the financial system weaknesses exposed by the global financial crisis. In Sydney, we pledge to complete as much of the financial regulation agenda as possible. Policy uncertainty in this area began to impede key drivers of growth right across the financial services world. And from our discussion in Cairns, it's clear we've made great strides in delivering stability and certainty in that area. Globally, banks will have more and better quality capital, as well as better defences against liquidity pressures. We've made substantial progress in addressing the problem of institutions that are deemed too big to fail. And as part of this work, the Financial Stability Board, under the steadfast and I might say impressive leadership of Governor Mark Carney, uh, it will soon release a proposal for additional loss absorbing capacity for global banks. This will further protect taxpayer funds if large global banks run into difficulty. That's an extremely important issue. And I know it's particularly important here in the United States. It and the FSB proposal have now been largely resolved. I pay tribute to central bank governors and regulators who have not only worked incredibly hard this year to deliver these outcomes, but have been prepared to make some compromises to bring about a greater benefit for all. In addition to the rules governing bank failure, We've also made substantial progress on concerns about the shadow banking sector. And lastly, we have reinforced our commitment to reducing systemic risks and increasing transparency in markets for complex derivative products. These reforms will deliver a safer financial system that supports and facilitates greater economic growth. As a result, our citizens will have confidence in the stability of the global financial system and industry will have the confidence to invest. Ladies and gentlemen, Brisbane will mark a turning point for international financial regulation. Uh, it's not just me saying it. Governor Carney advised that to the G20 ministers in Cairns. He said, we're drawing a line in the sand at Brisbane. And it is time to draw a line in the sand on the global financial crisis. Let's move on. From the time of the leaders meeting onwards, we will look forward, not backwards, neither fighting old wars nor re-prosecuting old agendas. With key elements of the financial reform agenda substantially completed, our focus will shift to implementation. Policy uncertainty must be removed. We want the financial regulation architecture to be set up quickly for the next phase of global growth so it can pick up emerging issues, as well as balance stability with risk taking. This will be supported by the changes initiated by the FSB, including a review of its representation and an annual report on the implementation and impact of reforms. Third, we are on track to deliver a fair and effective international tax framework. In 2013, at St Petersburg, members unanimously agreed to a 15-point base erosion and profit shifting action plan to be completed by the end of 2015. The two-year action plan will not only help secure revenue bases, it will bring international tax rules into the 21st century, a system, I might add, that was set up just after World War I. And it will ensure they keep up with the changing business models of multinational companies. In Sydney, we expressed our continued full support with G20 and importantly, non-OECD countries all involved in the project on an equal footing. In Cairns, we welcome progress made on the action items delivered this year. Seven of the 15 proposals have been presented by the OECD to our ministers. The remainder will be presented in Turkey next year. Sure, there's still much work to be done between now and the end of next year, but the progress we have made is extraordinary. And members are resolute about completing this complex agenda in 2015 as agreed. After all, we are finance ministers. We don't like to miss out on revenue anywhere. The G20 is also working to improve taxation, liability, transparency. We are determined we are determined to crack down on global tax evasion. Over the last few months, we've endorsed the Common Reporting Standard 
on the automatic exchange of tax information. In Cairns, we made a strong commitment to implementing it rapidly and calling on outlying financial centres to do the same. This will give our tax authorities the information they need to identify and deal with tax cheats. Let me be very clear, a tax cheat is a thief. I want to assure you that finance ministers in the G20 are very determined to use all available resources to ensure that loopholes to facilitate tax cheats are closed. And to complement our policy work, the G20 has, for the first time, supported cooperation among our tax authorities on compliance activities, which will be a key element in enforcing compliance and identifying tax risks. Tax avoidance and evasion are issues for everyone. That's why, this year, we also agreed to practical steps to help developing countries address base erosion and exchange tax information, including by facilitating the work of what have become known as tax inspectors without borders. Mm -hmm. Lastly, that's the ultimate ambassadorship, isn't it? <laughs> Lastly, we've improved the overall effectiveness of the G20, and we've done it in many different ways. One was by changing the nature of discussion. The G20 is well placed to be the preeminent global economic policy making body. The right people are in the room. The question is, are they having the right discussions? It seemed to me that there was significant fatigue within the G20, which no doubt stemmed from six years of addressing challenging economic circumstances and dealing with an agenda that expanded considerably during that time. So we chose to focus our efforts on getting global growth back on track, creating new jobs. We resisted putting new items on the agenda and focused on the issues the G20 had been debating for some time, but had failed to finally resolve. As such, we tried to direct ministerial discussions to where they were most needed. That is, towards agreement on key policy issues or cutting through roadblocks to growth. Members had in-depth discussions on macroeconomic cooperation and structural reform. We shifted the culture of the G20 by transforming it from a reactive institution into a more proactive, forward-looking one. In Sydney, we adopted practical changes to the meeting formats so that they would engender genuine discussion. We also look to build stronger relationships among members because if we were to work together more effectively, ministers need to know each other at a more personal level. This is important for the G20 because its strength comes from the familiarity of its members and their ability to leverage relationships. Better internal communication facilitates better external communication. It was clear to all the G20s, uh, it, was all, it was clear uh, that all the G20s public messaging simply had to improve. Our actions had to be understood and resonate with all members of the community not just the technocrats. So we've worked really hard to convey our outcomes in short, non-technical documents that are easily understood, beginning with a communique that is no more than two pages. We've also worked hard on our relationships with key stakeholders, including business and community representatives. This goes beyond traditional discussions to more meaningful engagement on the agenda. For example, we facilitated early engagement in Sydney on the infrastructure agenda with business representatives. This has resulted in the B20 undertaking considerable support work for our global infrastructure initiative. And I want to thank Robert Milliner and all the representatives of the B20 that have made such an enormous contribution throughout the year. In fact, the feedback from business in New York and elsewhere was that the Australian B20 has been the most successful in memory. So I congratulate the team. We've also worked closely with business throughout the year on our growth and financial regulation agendas. Needless to say, the expertise, insights and ideas of the business community have helped shape our vision for the G20 and ensured our policies make a real and positive difference for global growth and resilience. And for the first time at a formal G20 meeting, 
we brought together the G20's official engagement groups, such as the L20, representing Labor, the Y20, representing youth, the C20, representing community, and the T20, representing think tanks. They all formally met with finance ministers and central bank governors in Cairns. As significant as all of this is, the agreements we've reached, we have reached on ambitious reforms are only half the job. The next step is implementation. And that's important, not just for the G20's credibility, it's crucial in addressing the real challenges for the global economy. In the past, the G20's credibility has been called into question because members didn't always deliver on their commitments. And this has been largely attributed to the growing scope of the agenda. As the G20 presidency passes from one member to the next, its agenda continues to expand and the list of legacy issues inherited by each new president gets longer every year. This poses a risk because it can distract from more important issues affecting the global economy. This year we've tried to remedy these issues. We concentrated the agenda on lifting global growth and shoring up resilience. And we worked hard to build consensus among members on these priorities. It's now up to governments to deliver on their commitments, to bear the cost of failure. We need to show the world that the G20 can do more than agree to meaningful reforms. It can actually deliver them. We've done the talking, now we need the action. We need to implement and we must be accountable. Our Sydney Declaration had a five-year horizon. That's because we are tackling some fundamental challenges and, of course, that can take time. And through peer review of our growth strategies, we can keep each other honest. Of course, as policymakers, we know that many things are sometimes out of our control. If we have to, we must be prepared to commit to further reforms should macroeconomic conditions warrant it. We will draw on international organisations where their input can offer guidance on the impact or gaps of our policies. We will work with the IMF and the OECD on plans to monitor implementation and build effective accountability mechanisms. The motivation behind the Sydney Declaration is something that will keep driving us forward each year. So ladies and gentlemen, the G20's achievements this year have been considerable. The nations that sit around the G20 table can honestly say we have made a contribution. Given that we have leaders of 85% of the world's economy sitting at the table, it's timely to recognise that our deliberations can make a significant difference. To my colleagues and the many who support our work, I say thank you. Whilst our presidency may end in December, our efforts in support of the G20's work will not diminish. There is still much work to be done to stimulate growth, to facilitate job creation and to build infrastructure that delivers enduring prosperity for all our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You want to have a seat? Thanks. Thanks, 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 Appreciate it. So um, that was terrific, and I think um, you've achieved the objectives you laid out at the beginning of, of setting out some some concrete goals and targets, uh, communicating them well, uh, trying to put them into a broader narrative. And I think you you really uh, today proved that you've you've accomplished that part of the mission. And now you know there's the final push to actually get the things done that you need to get done. So uh, good luck with that. Um, uh, and I'm struck just from what it's worth as a comment. I was going to ask a question, but I want to let the audience ask two or three questions if sure. you're willing to do that. Plenty of time. Uh, just All that afternoon. When I was a, a yak, that is a Sherpa's uh, deputy, I've had a haircut since, um, uh, it was difficult to get consensus in that room. And, uh, you know, the, the, frankly, there were, there were floating coalitions. It wasn't sort of us versus them, but there were, there were different groups of countries. And I just wonder how you've managed to pull these, these countries together uh, whether you've picked the right issues or the right agenda that people can agree on. But then I guess I would ask a little mischievously, have you lowered the bar too much so that people can agree to things that are sort of uh, easy for people to agree to? Or have you done something special to kind of try to build consensus? Uh, so I guess I am asking a question before I open up the floor. Well, I suppose it's a little self-indulgent to reflect on it all whilst 
we've still got meetings to go. But um, uh, I think Sydney, you know, one of the comments from one of the leading finance ministers uh, at the beginning of this year was, uh, Joe, if you think we're going to spend 16 days flying up and down to Australia next year, you're kidding yourself. Uh, because even though the G20 is very important, three meetings in Australia uh, takes a lot of time to get there, and you know it's a bit of a, it's not going to work for us if it's not a meaningful agenda. Agenda. Uh, now we worked very hard on consulting everyone on what the agenda should be before we took up the presidency. Tony Abbott is one of those sort of people that is very focused as prime minister on outcomes rather than words, and uh, that suited the needs of the G20 perfectly. Now, uh, uh, I consulted all the ministers what, before we took the presidency and at this meeting last year. I said, what do you want out of the G20 next year? And what is going to be meaningful? And everyone's got the same problem. I mean, governments have run out of money. So uh, it's very difficult uh, and quite rare for governments to be able to use fiscal stimulus to create growth. I mean, there's some capacity, but overall, it's quite limited. Monetary policy uh, has, has been stretched as, you know, arguably as far as it should go, but in some cases, again, there would be exceptions, but monetary policy hasn't got the capacity to deliver. Therefore, we have to have structural reform. Now, what a lot of technocrats don't understand is that ultimately we are in politics, and Sometimes it's a good thing to have air cover when you're going into battle. And the air cover was that the G20 was saying the same thing as we say domestically, that we have to undertake difficult but important structural reforms. Because only through structural reform are we going to be able to truly build longer term growth in the global economy. It is also the case that there is a massive demand for infrastructure Governments haven't got the money to be able to deliver it. The private sector is awash in cash. They are looking for these sorts of projects. If we get our collective act together and having standardised rules and standardised documentation, and insofar as is possible to have things like similar access regimes to utility markets in developing countries as it is in developed countries, to get that together, then you become, you de-risk investment in public infrastructure and uh, de-risk the engagement process for the private sector. Now, these are all common sense. And the final area, uh, you know, that is financial reform. Uh, you know, there's a temptation after a crisis to blame someone for governments. We even do it occasionally. And, uh, uh, and understandably, uh, in the wake of the global financial crisis, financial institutions were blamed. So the response of governments has been to announce more regulation, either unilaterally or collectively. We're going to do this. We're going to have new regulation for that and so on. But the more regulation you have in the flow of capital, uh, the more expensive that capital can become, or less accessible, or ultimately it just adds to the uncertainty about direction. So working closely with Mark Carney, who I met when I was in opposition a few years ago when he was in Canada, uh, we formulated an agreement that we would nail down the priority, the real priorities for the FSB. I mean, the FSB had 73 work priorities, right? That was the legacy of the global financial crisis. Finance ministers, everyone kept saying the FSB, You've got to work on this, you've got to work on that. 73 work priorities is no priorities, right? So I asked Mark Carney, what are the big ones? What do we have to nail? And uh, too big to fail, shadow banking, Basel III, there was, a, there was a handful that needed to be nailed and over the counter derivatives as well. And we nail those and then the rest of it, well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it can fall off the table because uh, you know, we've, we've got to deal with the priorities and then get on with things. And, uh, and you know, the sweetest sound at the G20 finance ministers was uh, Mark Carney reporting back with the uh, central bank governors to say, we're drawing a line in Brisbane, the Brisbane line. That's when we stop looking back and start looking forward. 
and uh, we, we will deliver. There's a couple of outlying things, but uh, and we had to get a couple of countries over the line, and that takes uh, quite a bit of effort, but not only have we got a great team, I've got a persuasive style. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's, that's clear. All right, well, um, let's uh, take some questions, uh, two or three questions, yes, ma'am. Uh, please wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and, and do ask a short question. Thank you very much. Barbara Matthews with BCM International Regulatory Analytics. My question is short. Um, why are you so optimistic about the effectiveness of peer review over a five-year time horizon when the recent history, whether it's in the G20 and the mutual assessment process or more spectacularly in the Eurozone with the Stability and Growth Pact, yeah. suggests caution might be advisable when relying on peer review to incentivize governments to override domestic political constraints to meet well, an international obligation. Yeah. Well, when I talk about peer review, we're working with the IMF and the OECD to undertake that review. So we'll all be exposed. Uh, and uh, I would hope and expect that everyone would sign up to that. Uh, and as much as we don't necessarily like the uh, uh, every statement that comes out of the IMF and the OECD, uh, it's effective. Transparency helps to deal with, you know, uh, the challenges. Uh, I think part of the problem in the past has been there's been a lack of transparency about performance. And if it's transparent and that it's not just for you but it's open to everyone, then, well, you know, Certainly, we want to benchmark ourselves in Australia against the best in the world. That's what we want to do. That's our benchmark. Other countries might have different priorities. And sure, other countries have got many different challenges to us. But I find, it, uh, I find the uh, independent, transparent and uh, forthright approach of the OECD and the IMF on things helpful. OK, great. Yes, sir. Press question, I warn you. Thanks, Matt, again. Yeah. <laughs> Treasurer, a wonderful speech. I'm just wondering with the World Economic Outlook downgrade over the last couple of days, the US economy is strengthening, uh, but Europe and Japan continue to struggle. Can the world economy tick over and do OK just with the US firepower alone? Well, it helps, but... I'm not as bearish as many others about China. Uh, it, it, yes, there will be some measure of volatility, but what matters most is the determination of individual governments to do something that involves structural reform. And what has been most encouraging to me sitting around the table at the G20 is the reform agenda of various countries uh, as they've outlined, but in a number of cases actually delivered. Now, there is domestic reform in China. And, uh, uh, you know, when Lo Ji Wei goes through the list of reforms that they're undertaking, and not all of them are public, uh, it is, to me, encouraging and represents... Uh, and I know from various other sources on the ground that they are being implemented, therefore... Uh, I, I am not as pessimistic about China as some others. Of course, they're going to have you know, uh, property bubbles and various other things, but overall, it's a reformist government. In Japan, again, it is a reformist government. Now, people have, in some cases have been sceptical, but uh, you, know, you look at the numbers, you look at what they've done, and for example, in relation to uh, indirect taxes in Japan, and you say, this is very encouraging. And in our own negotiations on a free trade agreement, we saw Japan go further than it had previously done. Uh, and that's encouraging. Europe's a bit different. Europe has its own challenges. Uh, and many of you will be familiar with those. Um, and I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't venture an opinion on Europe. Uh, but uh, the United States, I think, is, is, is showing good signs of, of growth. But again, the old ways are not necessarily going to be the, the new ways. You can't look at the global economy from the rear vision mirror. You have to look forward. And uh, I'm 
Tomorrow is better than today, and today is better than yesterday in the global economy. Okay, so that's where I'm at. You didn't talk much about trade, but, but we talked a lot about it earlier, and uh, I think uh, the, since you mentioned Japan, I, I think that the best thing that we can all do is try and persuade Japan to open its agriculture market, to get TPP done, and, uh, and move that agenda forward. I think that would be a huge contribution. Not This is more a bilateral conversation than a G20 one, but, uh, but trade is clearly an important, I mean, a critical engine of growth. Well, it's and, uh, hugely important. And after the GFC, there was a tendency for some countries to put up protective barriers. And there is still that danger in, in, in a number of jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why, to be honest, from my perspective and Australia's perspective, if multilateral negotiations aren't moving, we will go into bilateral negotiations aggressively because ultimately if you expand the market uh, for your produce and if you can do anything you can in order to have freer trade around the world, uh, then that is a big step forward. Uh, and particularly in Asia, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, Asia will be the growth engine of the world over the next 30 years and beyond and uh, there's a lot of entrenched politics in the region, historic politics. People have been beating on the doors of the Europeans in relation to agricultural barriers for years. Well, we haven't got years, so let's get on with it. Good. Agreed. Okay, one more. Alan? Uh, Alan Alexandrov, uh, the director of the Global Symmetry Project, Monk School at the University of Toronto. Um, it's a great town. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Matt earlier mentioned that he thought the G20 had moved beyond the, the debate on physical consolidation, which was really at the Toronto summit, a little bit at Korea, but really at the Toronto summit and that it would appear that you've gotten everybody on side with respect to growth, the 2% target and so forth. Are you confident, though, that you have on board, uh, for instance, in the European, which I noticed you stepped aside on, uh, particularly with respect to Germany and, and its impact, one within the, European, uh, the Eurozone, but more generally on the argument about growth as opposed to fiscal consolidation? So you're asking me the European question again, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, look, the fundamental point is this. Um, I can, w look, uh, I've got all these bells ringing in my head here. Uh, uh, Germany was initially the most cynical about the 2% target. And Wolfgang, uh, who I have an enormous amount of respect for, uh, and uh, is very much the elder statesman of the G20 finance ministers, was concerned that putting a number on growth was you know, a target that may not be achievable. Uh, and it's fair to say he is amongst uh, now the strongest advocates for what we've done. And you can understand why, because he wants to see the structural reform that we talk about, and in a sense, fiscal stimulation is, is an easy option. I say in a sense, I'm, I, I, I don't want to over-egg it, but the countries that did undertake fiscal consolidation and did have structural reform are now getting the benefit in partnership with the IMF and uh, to some degree. And, uh, countries that haven't undertaken structural reform and haven't had that steely determination to change uh, are um, continuing to lose effective control of their budgets. Fiscal reform and fiscal consolidation is, is a discipline. It's a discipline on government, it's a discipline on parliaments. It is a challenge in Australia because we have some people that say more debt is not a bad thing and comparatively we have low debt. That is a narrow-minded and short-sighted approach because anyone who's an expert on the future could only understand that you don't know what it looks like. And in that sense, fiscal consolidation 
as a plan and fiscal consolidation as a deliverable is an important discipline on communities and on government. Uh, and it effectively pushes you towards structural reform. Now, this, this, this debate between structural reform and fiscal consolidation is nothing new, but I understand where Germany's coming from in arguing that we've got to have structural reform in Europe. And a number of economies that have not had fiscal discipline have failed to have significant structural reform. Uh, there is a temptation to turn on the tap, uh, particularly at this moment. I'll leave that to the Europeans to work out. Uh, but from my perspective, what's more important for Europe is a real commitment to structural reform. It covers trade, it covers labour relations. That's a big one. Uh, and there are other issues in relation to competition. Uh, and also, I know Mario Draghi is doing a, a terrific job in endeavouring to have uh, appropriate stress tests and, uh, and transparency associated with the banking system in Europe. Uh, but you can see the recovery in the United States, financial system and banks, compared with where the European banks are at, and you ask why, and then you start to get some of the answers to the questions that you asked. Okay, well, terrific. You, you have a busy schedule. We want to let you go, but really terrific tour de force and, and, and a tremendous uh, capstone to our event today. So please join me in thanking Trevor.